rendering in cycles can be the nail on the coffin of a project. Seeing that 4 day render time on your 300 frame donut animation has probably made you question your life's decisions at some point too. But it doesn't have to be this way. Using improved settings, I managed to speed up my own renders around 3000% without any real significant loss in quality. And so can you. And to prove that point, we need a scene that's going to be pretty hard to render. A scene with a large amount of polygons, objects, textures, reflections, transparency, depth of field, and all those other things that make your PC go nuclear when hitting F12. Which is exactly what I made for me and for you guys because you can download it for free on the Patreon to play around with these settings and test around for yourself. Now, if at any point you want to know my hardware setup, you can find it in the video description down below. Here I've also added the setup I used so we can create standardized results for our tests. Now, can you imagine owning a fresh, banging, shiny, certified, five-star, S-rated, $2,300 RTX 4090? And then hitting render and Blender telling you straight up, Jim, this is gonna take me forever. Now, that might sound like the dumbest thing ever, but you'd be surprised how many people run into this issue, which is almost always to them not having a GPU enabled to render with. Now, Blender can render in two ways. CPU or GPU, but a lot of the times when installing Blender, it defaults to none, which means it's going to use your CPU to render. Now, I own one of the fastest consumer CPUs currently available, but even with that, rendering this scene will take me long enough for me to take a long weekend trip to New York and leave me with time to make some coffee before it finishes. All this to say that you should always enable a GPU, if possible of course, as your cycle's render device. Depending on which GPU your PC has, you can choose from four options in Blender. CUDA, which has been around for a while and used to be the standard for rendering. It's better for simple scenes or using simple materials. Optics, which is a newer method and is generally 60 to 80% faster than CUDA with the same hardware but it usually only is faster for complex scenes with lots of reflections and refractions. It uses the RT cores, which are available on RTX cards and also on GTX cards with a new DirectX 12 update. And as an example, the benchmark scene rendered around two minutes faster using optics compared to CUDA. Third, we have HIP, which is for AMD graphics cards using their Vega architecture. And finally, we have the One API for Intel Arc GPUs, which are a very new thing. And I'm actually curious as to how these perform. So if you own one of these cards, I would love it if you download the test scene, render it out, and share with me in the comments how long that took you. No matter the choice though, choosing a GPU will almost always be faster than using your CPU to render. Having said that, it used to be the case that using both CPU and GPU for rendering, which you can again do in the system preferences, was slower. But not anymore. Nowadays, using both devices for rendering results in the fastest renders, with the benchmark scene rendering around 5 seconds faster using both devices. So assuming you're now actually using your GPU and CPU to render, let's really start improving those renders speeds. All that talking made me kind of hungry, so it's time for a healthy snack. And since my PC is not doing anything while I'm eating, might as well boot up the Salad app. Salad is a compute sharing community that basically lets you earn rewards using your computer's GPU power. If you own an RTX 3060 or better, you can earn up to $200 a month in rewards by having companies literally pay you for your computing power. So when you're not working hard on your Blender skills, start up the Salad app and start shopping for money to spend on amazing rewards such as games like Minecraft or Call of Duty, gift cards for Steam, PlayStation, Xbox, Nintendo or Amazon, and actual money on your PayPal account. Just to name a few of the literal thousands of rewards available. Now I've been running my own RTX 4090 on and off for some time now and already made over $50, which is perfect to buy some Blizzard balance to keep my addiction to World of Warcraft running for free. <laughs> oh, um, so yeah, sell it is 100% nice. free. I like this one, which actually cost me a couple of dollars and it's completely safe for your PC. So make sure to download it now, link in the description and start shopping today. In most Blender tutorials, courses or lessons, you'll find the first step people take to improve speed is to lower the samples used. And they're right. Lowering the amount of samples lowers the amount of time it takes for a render to finish. But it's kind of weird to always render a certain amount of samples, no matter how simple or complex the scene, don't you think? A completely one color screen doesn't need as many samples to look right as this complex sci-fi scene. To help understand this, it's 
important to know what a sample is. Samples are paths to trace for each pixel. Cycles is a path tracing engine, meaning it fires these paths from the camera, determines the light, reflection, and refraction bounces, and eventually returns to the source, giving us an idea of the color of this pixel. The amount of samples is equal to the amount of paths fired for each pixel in your render, and the more samples, the better the accuracy of the color of the pixel. In a scene with only one color, one path per pixel would technically be enough to give us the correct image, so using one sample should work. A scene with hundreds of textures, lights, shadows, reflections, and refractions, however, needs way more, especially without denoising. Now that makes you think, right? There should be something smarter that knows which part of an image are easy to render and which are not. And of course there is. It's called the noise threshold and it's right above the max samples in the render settings, which makes sense since you're better off using this versus changing the samples. Anyways, the noise threshold is also called adaptive sampling and its purpose is to automatically reduce the number of samples in areas that have little noise. So for example, this speaker material here needs a lot of samples for the hair particles, but the plain background doesn't need as many. If I now show you the render using only one sample, this becomes obvious as you can see a lot of the detail lacking in the speaker, but the background looks almost done already. Noise threshold is truly amazing and that's why it's always on by default. You can see it do its job if you set the samples to 20,000 for example, as it will still cut off the render at some point saying, that's It literally looks at the noise in your renders per pixel and determines if it crosses this threshold number. When it does, it stops sampling that pixel. The power here lies in the fact we can control this value in Blender. By increasing this number, the sampling per pixel becomes lower, making your renders faster, but also more noisy. The choice in this is completely up to you. For quick iteration renders, using a high value of even 0.5 is probably better. But for your final render, going down to 0.02 or 3 might be better. To show you what a difference it makes, I've rendered the benchmark scene using several noise thresholds. You can see the quality does decrease while increasing the noise threshold, and at some point it really becomes kind of ugly and smudged. But then again, the render time went down from 5 minutes and 13 seconds with the default settings to an absolutely crazy 4.5 seconds per frame using the noise threshold at 0.5. Now, just to put that in perspective, for a 300 frame animation, this would save you around 25 hours of rendering. But herein lies its problem. Denoising is a tool used in render engines to remove noise from the final rendered image. In an ideal world, you'd be able to render everything in 10,000 samples without the need for noise thresholds or denoisers, but hardware isn't powerful enough for that yet. So for now, Blender has two built-in denoise tools, Optics and Open Image Denoise. Optics uses an AI algorithm, again based on Nvidia's Optics RT cores, and Open Image Denoise is an Intel CPU-based denoiser. And to be honest, both do a great job at denoising your images. Here's a comparison of no denoising, optics, and open image side by side using a relatively high noise threshold of 0.1. And as you can see, it makes all the difference, allowing you to get away with higher noise thresholds while still having great results. Both denoising methods have their advantages. Optics is better for animations, I'll get back to that in a bit, and open image is better for stills. Now the difference between the two decreases the lower the noise threshold you're using. This is because denoising basically guesses what pixels should look like after the render finishes sampling. The more samples it has to work with, lower noise threshold, the less guessing it needs to do. But generally speaking, for still images, open image results in a less noisy and smoother looking image. In animations, it's a completely different story, however. Since in animation the frames change every scene, the guesswork for each frame also changes. This results in a very common issue on Blender animation renders, denoising artifacts. The only true fix for this problem is something called a temporal denoiser. Now, without going into that too deep, this basically means a denoiser that looks at both the frame before and after the current frame to create a denoising result with the least amount of changes for the smoothest result. Now both optics and open image are not temporal denoisers sadly. However, since optics uses an AI powered algorithm using the RT cores on your GPU, it does have a way more stable result for animation renders. So my advice would be to use open image denoising for when you're working on still renders, but use optics for animation projects, just like this next setting, which could save you additional hours of rendering on your animations. 
Every time you hit render, you'll notice that Blender first starts doing all kinds of calculations. Stuff like compiling, building the BVH, whatever that may be, loading textures, loading the importance map. Anyways, these preparations are all done before the render actually starts and can take a few seconds to calculate it. So if these calculations took Blender 5 seconds and the render also took 5 seconds, you had to wait 10 and not 5 which is what it shows in the final render time. Now this becomes increasingly annoying if you render an animation because it doesn't do this just once, but for every frame. There luckily is an option to store all these preparations in your PC's memory, so Blender only has to calculate them once. It's called persistent data. You can find it under the performance tab and enabling it is only one simple click to save you from waiting for, well, waiting, I guess. <laughs> This is reliant on you having enough memory for Blender to use to store this data in and also requires you to actually start a render once so it can store the data for the next time. So in the case you make a project and are certain you're only going to hit render once, ever, 100% sure you'll never do it more than once and you don't make mistakes, this setting might not be necessary. In all other scenarios though, do it! I lied to you before. Although the camera fires paths, it's not the only type of path fired by cycles to determine how the final image looks. There's actually four types of rays that Blender uses to create the final product. Number one, camera, the ray, which I spoke about before, which comes straight from the camera. Number two, reflection, which is a ray generated by the reflection of a surface. Number three, transmission, is the ray generated by a transmission through a surface. And number four, shadow, the ray is used for transparent shadows. Now I'm hearing you say, Dude, when will my renders be faster? <laughs> well, bear with me, it does actually matter you understand this. Because this all relates to the light paths tab in the render settings, where it goes over your max bounces. These bounces are the rays bouncing around in your scene, passing through objects, being absorbed, etc. and are in addition to the sampling paths. Simply put, if you were to set this total value here to zero, this means Blender will only fire the camera paths, resulting in a scene consisting only of direct lighting, which in the case of our benchmark scene, looks absolutely horrendous. All bounce lighting is now gone, we can't see through the glass anymore, and most reflections and refractions are gone too. However, it did decrease the overall render time by 12 seconds compared to having everything default and the noise threshold at 0.1. And so again, this comes down to some trial and error. There are several types of bounces, and I currently have set them all to zero. Now let's start increasing the ones that are relevant to our render. For the total value, we'll put it on something like 8 for now. This means that whatever value we use below that, Blender will never use more than 8 bounces total. Now as I said, all the bounce lighting was gone, so it's probably a good thing to add some diffuse bounces. We also have some glossy surfaces like metals and glass, so let's make sure to add those in too. There's no transmission in this scene, so we can leave that at zero, and there's also no volumetrics in the shot, so let's leave that at zero too. Finally, we do have glass that we need to see through, so let's put our transparent bounces on four. As you can see, this does change the render, resulting in less reflections, bounce lighting, and an overall slightly darker image. But it did shave off second rendering compared to having the bounces on default. When it comes to the light paths, it's important to really find the right values for your project. Setting it up properly can save some time on your renders without any visible loss of detail. Other times, you definitely need those bounces for the result, and it's really up to you as the artist to decide whether this change is worth it. Professionally, I'd leave them up, but for personal projects, saving that 4 to 5 seconds per frame on a several 100 frames long animation can definitely be worth it. Now, besides the three main pillars of render settings to get both the fastest and best looking results, there's a host of small things you can try to further improve your render speed. Like, make sure you're in solid view before hitting render, saving some valuable VRAM for your scene. This will both help speed up your renders as well as help prevent running out of VRAM. Renders do tend to crash every now and then, especially if you have a lower end GPU. So render out your scenes as PNG sequences and use the Blender video editor to turn them into videos. Someone commented on my old video that a lower tile size found in the performance tab can help improve your render speed. 
I tried, but for my setup, it resulted in longer renders, not shorter. Let me know if this works for you though in the comments. Might be a bit of a dumb dumb point, but closing other applications frees up memory and GPU and CPU usage, so try closing as much applications as possible before hitting render. In the light paths tab, you can also disable both caustics settings for a minor performance boost, but does have an impact on caustic stuff like water. Also in the light paths tab, you can find fast GI approximation, which uses ambient occlusion and approximated diffuse light to generate global illumination. I feel it has a certain look and I don't particularly enjoy it, but it does make your renders quite a bit faster. If you're working on preview renders to see what the result will look like, you can always render out a small region of the screen. By pressing Ctrl B, you can select a portion of your scene to render. We call this the render region. This is both faster and lighter on your PC. You could also use this technique to prevent running out of VRAM. By the way, if you want to remove the render region, just press Ctrl-Alt-B. Blender allows you to put things in layers, meaning you could separate a project in foreground, background, and midground objects, and then you can render each of these separately and combine them later on. This can both be faster, as Blender only has to render small parts of the total project, and is another way to prevent running out of VRAM. As a general statement, I'd advise you to first look at a proper noise threshold for your scene, choose the right denoise option, and finally change the light paths if necessary. All the shots in this video were rendered at 2560 times 1440 or Quad HD. This means there's a total of almost 3.7 million pixels to render. Lowering the resolution to for example Full HD or 1920 times 1080 lowers that to 2.07 million pixels, drastically decreasing the time it takes to render the image. High resolutions are nice for quality, but only use them if you really need it. If you don't want to be bothered setting all of this up, you can get my version of the best render settings by joining the Patreon or getting it on Blender Market through the link in the description. This contains my ideal setup that I use as a basis for almost all my projects and only tweak if necessary for the result. And that's what it all comes down to in the end. Trying out different things and finding the balance between quality and speed. And since you now know how to speed up your renders, you'll probably want to learn how to achieve quality next. So check out this video to learn the most important tool that you have as a 3D artist.